Um, I want to thank everybody um, who is on tonight. Uh, some of you are medical and healthcare. Some of you are just interested in this. Some of you are parents. Um, I don't know if we have a couple athletes on here as well. But uh, really, the, the point of tonight is to go over, you know, what the science and data and, you know, the experts on our panel tonight, what really are some of the causes that have been identified so far and that we think may be ways we can explore ways to either reduce injury or maybe new um, opportunities to um, improve performance even going forward in, you know, the throwing injury epidemic in baseball and softball. Um, I do want to welcome everyone that is here again, as uh, for those of you who may just be signing in, uh, I mentioned it might be kind of fun to see where everyone is from. And, and so far, um, you know, obviously from the United States, all over the country, a couple of folks from Canada, uh, Dr. Kita, obviously in Japan. Um, so we want to, you know, make sure that everyone understands that this is not just for division one athletes or just for major league baseball players. This is for athletes in both sports at all levels of sport. And it's really important to the entire panel, um, you know, to make sure that we're inclusive to all athletes and in both sports. Um, I do want to mention that the personal opinions offered during the webinar, while based on evidence-based data, they we do not represent our institutions. We don't represent our athletes or organizations or speak on their behalf uh, or for the teams that we're sports medicine volunteers for. I'd also want to put up this picture, and granted, this is more at professional level. You can see from Japan to Canada to the U.S. just how many different teams there are. And this is obviously just the top of the top of the top, if you will. But, you know, one of the things that's really cool about baseball and softball is everything's the same, but then there's some differences as well. So I'm hoping that we can, you know, take away some, some pearls of wisdom from different folks with different perspectives from different sports as well as from all over the world. Um, it, it's without saying, and for those of us who are part of AMSM, uh, we want to thank AMSSM as an organization, as well as Andy Meyer, who is the AMSM communications manager that, you know, spends his evenings doing a lot of these webinars amongst everything else behind the scenes. So I'll make sure that Andy gets credit. So thank you, Andy. Um, Andy is a huge Kansas City fan. So um, I, I still remember the Royals of the 80s, and, and hopefully uh, they're going to start, you know, turning it around now. So just to give you an idea of the individuals that Dr. Bowers and I are, are, are fortunate enough to have on this panel tonight, these are some of the teams that we help with in one form or another. Um, everyone from, you know, Major League Baseball to high-level Division I baseball and softball to um, Ivy League Baseball to Division Three institutions to Team Canada to – United States and Japan at the at the U18 level, as well as minor league baseball. So we really run the gamut. Um, and this is just from the from what we do in our professional athletic training, team physician responsibilities. This doesn't even mention the hundreds of manuscripts and original data that our panel um, has performed over their careers. Um, so what I'm going to do first is I just want to kind of introduce our expert panel, and then I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes, and then I'll tell you what the next steps are. We're intending for this to go from about uh, 8.30 to between 9.30 to 10 uh, Eastern time, but we are respectful, especially of those folks on the East Coast, as well as I know Dr. Kita probably has got to get to, get to the OR when he's done uh, since it's Wednesday in Japan. Um, I've done this in alphabetical order. So first is Dr. Uh, Robert Bowers. So Dr. Bowers is an assistant professor of orthopedics and physical medicine rehabilitation at Emory. He's also the director of the baseball medicine program. He's a team physician for, for numerous um, levels of sport, particularly for uh, from Major League Baseball with the Braves to D1 with Georgia Tech to the College Park Skyhawks and then Woodward Academy, which um, I can't remember, uh, Robbie, was that where you – went to high school or you have some affiliation with them, right? Yeah, that's where I went to high school. So, so you know, it's kind of, kind of giving back to the community, which is pretty cool. Dr. Bowman um, is an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery, sports medicine at Vanderbilt in Nashville, Tennessee. He's the head orthopedist for the Nashville Sound. So that's the AAA affiliate for the Brewers. He's also a team physician for Vanderbilt as well as the Metro Nashville Public School. Uh, school. So, you know, one thing I wanted to mention is on our panel, not only do we have experts in softball and baseball, but we also have different types of training backgrounds for the clinicians. So we have athletic training, 
we have uh, physical medicine rehabilitation, we have pediatrics, we have orthopedic surgery. So we, we do run the gamut tonight also, which was very important to Dr. Bowers and myself. So we have a, a good breadth of individuals. Dr. Griffiths is our other, sur uh, our other United States surgeon on the panel. He is a partner at the Peachtree Orthopedics in Atlanta, specialized in shoulder, elbow, and knee surgery. Um, he is the shoulder, elbow, knee orthopedic surgeon for the Braves. He's also the medical director for the Georgia Swarm, which is uh, a professional lacrosse. He's a clinical professor for the Emory University Orthopedic Sports Surgery Sports Medicine Fellowship, and he's the team uh, orthopedic surgeon for UGA for their baseball team. And he has a special interest in UCL repair and reconstruction, and he's, he's published extensively on this topic, as all of our uh, panelists have. Dr. Holtz is uh, a member of the Softball Pitching Advisory Committee. She's a physiatrist, and she's the medical director for Triumph Health in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, what is very nice and quite honestly very cool is Dr. Holtz has walked in the shoes of all the athletes that we try to treat. She is a former 2004 Olympian for Canada in softball and a 2003 silver medalist Pan American uh, for softball as well. So you can see that's why only folks who have been uh, part of the Olympics um, can actually have the, the initials OLY after their name. So that's why Dr. Holtz has that on. So we're very lucky to have her as well. Dr. Yoshi Kida Kazu. Um, Dr. Kazu is an assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedics, uh, Graduate School of Medical Science in Kyoto, Prefectural University of Medicine. I was fortunate enough to, to meet Dr. Kazu when we were both uh, covering uh, teams for the U18 World Series in Sarasota, Florida a couple of years ago. And he was the team physician for uh, Team Japan at the U18 level. Dr. Chris is the director of the Injured Throwers Program at the McKaylee Center at Boston Children's. Uh, and his research interests include risk factors for UCL injuries in adolescent baseball pitchers. And he's appeared on podcasts with Dr. Uh, with Eric Cressy, who is the director of player health and performance for the Yankees. Uh, Dr. Chris uh, used to help take care of uh, the Brown baseball team. And now he's one of the team physicians for Babson, uh, which is a Division three school just outside of Boston. Dr. Oliver is... I, I, I tried to kind of wean down uh, what we can say about Dr. Oliver, but she is, in my opinion, if you have any questions about softball medicine, if you don't ask her, you're not asking the right person. She is the expert on softball medicine, uh, not only in the country, probably in the world. She's a professor of, uh, in the School of Kinesiology and Director of Sports Medicine and Movement at Auburn uh, in Alabama. She's the president of the American Baseball Biomechanics Society. She's a distinguished fellow uh, in ACSM, a certified athletic trainer, and a corrective exercise specialist. Um, I think one thing that is really important is we have all of our clinical ideas, but we want to make sure that this is evidence-based. So you can see that Dr. Oliver has published more than 180 peer-reviewed manuscripts and is getting close to uh, 500 national and international presentations. She's the chair of the new Softball Pitching Advisory Committee. And really, we're really quite honored to have her here tonight. Uh, this is me. <laughs> My name is uh, Jason Zaremski. I am an associate professor of PMR and sports medicine. Uh, I'm the director of the UF Health Throwing Clinic here in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to work with uh, you know lots of different people that uh, have expertise in baseball and softball in Gainesville, as well as throughout the country and world. So uh, very happy to uh, you know help moderate this with Dr. Bowers tonight. So, you know, we'll go back to a question is why are we here tonight? Why are folks spending their evenings or in some places their, their mornings on Wednesday, um, you know, doing this as opposed to watching the Celtics game or watching a baseball game on ESPN? Well, we know there's tons of injuries in baseball and softball, and they're not decreasing even with improved metrics, with improved training, with evidence-based data. And part of that may be, there may be some misinformation out there. And in particular on social media, I, I think I'm not um, raising any new information when we, we all kind of say, be careful with what you see on social media. But I think with recently some high level, high profile uh, major league baseball pitchers all having, uh, requiring UCL surgery of some form or another recently, um, some of the social media platforms sort of you know, lost their heads a little bit with a lot of information out there, some of it good and some of it maybe not quite as informed as it should be. So that really was the genesis for, for this tonight. So why are there, as an example, so many UCL injuries? And for those of you who are not medical, UCL is the ulnar collateral ligament. We sometimes refer to it or you hear about it is called the Tommy John ligament. 
Well, there are many reasons, not just one reason. It could be due to overuse. It could be due to prior injury in that area or different areas of your body. Maybe there's what's called connect chain deficits. Maybe there's a weak link somewhere in your body and your elbow bears the brunt of that. What about this thing called weighted ball velocity programs? I, Dr. Bowers will talk on that a little bit. And I know some of our panelists have some thoughts on those programs as well. What about sports specialization? This is a huge issue, especially in the adolescent age group. So particularly if you're younger than middle school. And then obviously biomechanics, you, had, you need to be able to throw and throw correctly. Um, otherwise you're going to run into some trouble. And this is just some data, quite honestly, that uh, Dr. Chris, Dr. Bowers, myself, and two colleagues at the University of Florida presented at AMSM uh, last month. This is taken, and I put the, the reference below, from what's called the Tommy John surgery list. This is actually a publicly available list that's maintained by Mr. John Rogelli. Um, and, you know, you have to take this with a grain of salt because it is anytime something's reported in the media, he puts it into his list, and it is quite extensive. What we did is we took a look at it because this is the 50th year since the first Tommy John surgery, the first UCL reconstruction in 1974. And if you take a look and we break this up by decade, so the first 20 years we had a combined because there were so few, you can see in the left-hand side from the 1974 and 1994 era, there were only 74 UCL reconstructions. And the most recent decade, this is through October of last year, there is 870 and this continues to go up. If we look at the average age of UCL reconstructions by in just in professional baseball, you can see that there has been close to a 12 to 13 percent decrease in age. Now, why does that matter? Well, part of that matters because if you figure out that with the exception of a couple of the younger uh, Dominican folks who are signed when they're age 16, everyone's either 18 or 21, 22 when you're signed. So if age is going down from 26, 27 to an average of 23, that means people are having these surgeries at an earlier age once they're signed to a professional contract. So that means things are happening at a younger age than they were in the past. Then what we did is, well, let's just look at the lowest levels of professional baseball. So rookie ball and A ball, which are typically going to be your youngest players. There has been a 62 fold increase in the number of UCL reconstructions and or repairs since the first 20 years after the first one was done in 1974. So obviously this is permeating down, not from your 30 year old pitcher, your John Smoltz's of the world, but it's permeating down to your younger pitchers. And in fact, if we look at some data from the American Sports Medicine Institute in Birmingham, Alabama, where Dr. Andrews and Dr. Fleisig and Dr. Ken Dugas are, this was data they put out um, that uh, ended somewhere around 2013, 2014. So this is just looking at youth in high schools, UCL reconstructions. And if you look from 1995 till just shy of 2015, there's been a nearly 25 to 30% increase. And I've seen plenty of quotes that Dr. Andrews has even said, the greatest number of UC, UCL surgeries being done now is not on the professional athlete, it's on the high school athlete. So when does the injury cycle start? Is it when you're a youth? Is it when you're in that kind of pre-high school, middle school era? What about when you're in high school, you know, that 14 to 18 year old age group? What about in college? Or in, in obviously with the, the 20 year anniversary, I think of Kerry Wood, um, or 26 year anniversary, Kerry Wood and his 20 strikeouts. I have put Kerry Wood picture up there, but what about if you're at the pro or Olympic level? Well, quite honestly, the injury cycle starts before the high school age level. It could be when you're 10, could be when you're 11, could be when you're 12. Now, does that mean you're going to have a severe injury? No, but you lay in place the groundwork, the building blocks of how do you throw correctly? How do you pitch correctly? How are you efficient? How do you train? It all starts when you're younger and you only build upon that as you get older. So why do we get injured? In general, this is a very straightforward cartoon that Dr. Gabbett, who's in Australia, who's kind of the godfather of workload in sports, uh, put out uh, about seven years ago. And there's things called intrinsic risk factors. Then there's things called extrinsic risk factors. And then an athlete becomes predisposed and susceptible. And then you expose him or her to an inciting event, which is usually in this case throwing if we're talking about baseball and softball. We also need to know, you know, to get a little deep in the weeds regarding the numbers, why, why do folks have all these injuries more so in baseball, some in softball, softball aren't as severe, 
as opposed to other sports when you're throwing. Well, if you go to the numbers, and I'm not a biomechanist, but you know, I have looked up these numbers, and there's a lot of us that kind of like this stuff. When you look at the forces and the torques and the angular velocity, otherwise known as how fast you're moving in kind of a, a circle, if you will, you can see baseball pitchers compared to other pitchers, even a football American football quarterback, your arm is going a lot slower. When you look at the forces and torques, particularly baseball and softball pitchers, you have a significant amount of forces, and there's different types of forces, but on your shoulder. Softball pitchers can up, be upwards of their body weight. So if you have a 200-pound pitcher, you have 200 pounds of force going at 5,000 degrees per second. That's a lot of force on the front of your shoulder. If you're a baseball pitcher, you could have 250 pounds on compressive forces, so kind of pushing down your shoulder, and then also have forces in the front and back of your shoulder at the same time. So that's kind of why when you look at the numbers, this is so important. But why do these injuries actually occur? They occur again for many reasons. Maybe your mechanics are poor. Maybe it's the pitch type. And obviously that's pretty controversial, but we can talk about that later on. Are you throwing too many curve balls? Are you throwing now a sweeper, which has become uh, more popular, but also a concern uh, when you increase your spin rate, particularly at the baseball, uh, at the high levels of baseball. What about physical makeup? Does a six foot three person have the same forces as a five foot three person? Obviously, nutrition, genetics, some height and weight, and there's a little bit of God-given ability as well. But all of these come into play. This is why this is such a challenging um, aspect to try to reduce these injuries, and we haven't been successful as sports professionals in the last 10, 20, 30 years. Now, what's really important, this is one of my favorite studies um, I, I quote all the time. This is from Dr. Fleissig, who uh, unfortunately, he has another commitment, otherwise he he told us he would have loved to be part of this, is looking at baseball pitching biomechanics, but it was a seven-year study. And for those of you who have never done uh, true research, prospective research, this is extremely difficult to do. But what it showed is that there's a lot of changes before you get to middle school, between nine to 13 for your kinematics. So that's your motion. And it became normalized between 13 and 15 for kinetics. So that's your forces. But we know that elbow and shoulder kinetics actually increase after 13. So what does that mean? That basically means that you have to learn the motion before 13, because once you turn 13 or thereabouts, you start going through what? Physical maturity. You start getting bigger, faster, stronger, go through puberty. And once you develop power and strength, that's when you can develop more significant injuries. So translation is if good mechanics are not taught by, uh, by high school, when power begins to increase, we run the potential risk for injuring structures in the shoulder and elbow. So what are some risk factors for these injury? Well, and this is something actually that was put out by Chris Camp, who's the head team physician for uh, the Minnesota Twins and his team at the Mayo Clinic, as well as some others from around the country. And what they found was that player demographics and characteristics, high velocity, throwing too much, I mean volume, and poor mechanics, those are the things that are really risk factors. Now, he also broke these, he and his team broke these down to modifiable and non-modifiable. I want you to look on the left-hand side. These are things you're going to hear a consistent theme tonight. High velocity, too much volume, poor mechanics. And this is a study our team at UF, um, we were fortunate, to, we just had this published last week, actually, at the American Journal of Sports Medicine. And we looked at workload and injuries in the high school pitcher. And what we found was very similar to Dr. Camp's uh, study, was that when there was increased velocity, increased intensity, and when you were older, which meant that you had more power, you had more strength, there was a statistically increased risk of injury, as opposed to if you threw at a lower velocity or didn't throw at high intensity or you were younger. We also know the chronic workload. So not over a week or not over one game, but over a season, over a year, over a career, that leads to increased throwing injury. And Dr. Mehta, who is a uh, doctor of physical therapy, he's, I believe he's in Orlando, Brittany Dowling, I believe he's in Chicago, and their colleagues did this study where they used a, uh, a, a wearable device and they took a look at the number of throws over three-year uh, study at a high school level. And they found a significant relationship between chronic load, subjective arm health, and throwing injury in, at the varsity high school baseball players. So they found that chronic load was indeed associated with increased injury risk. So 
There's other models as well. I don't want to bore you with this, but there are other models as well. This is from our team at UF that uh, took what Dr. Gabbett did and kind of took it a little further. We started to add in things like developmental risk factors, uh, sports specialization, things like that. And then this is a uh, a image that uh, Dr. Oliver has been guiding uh, those of us uh, you can see below on uh, specific to softball pitchers and arm health. Um, I, we would ask that you don't take any snapshots of this image that's been submitted for uh, for a manuscript right now. But you can see arm health is dependent on many different factors. And if you look at the softball pitcher, they're all intertwined together and they all combine to be a composite for arm health. Yes, some factors may uh, have more of an effect, such as velocity or pitching mechanics, but they all come into play. And essentially, and I took a quote, this just came out of uh, Sports Illustrated. Um, it was actually a quote from Dr. Fleissig and it said, essentially the UCL is being pushed beyond what it can take. Is There's a lot of trained facilities, a lot of them are good, but they become throw factories, velocity factories, and everyone wants to throw harder. So while there are a lot of factors, if you were to ask me, velocity and cumulative overuse are probably saying hold my beer when they think, you know, as they are probably some of the more important factors, particularly in our adolescent pitchers. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing. Dr. Bowers is going to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, then Dr. Kida. And then we've got a panel of questions for our expert panel. Some of them that we've developed the questions, some have come from social media that um, people are asking about. So with that, I'm going to unshare. Uh, Dr. Bowers, you set and ready to go? Yep, all good. One all right. second. I will mute myself. All right. So thanks, everyone, for, for joining tonight. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Zemsky and myself are are happy to see the number of people that join, have joined on for this and and um, think it's, it is important, certainly at this point in time, given the high profile injuries you've had recently, and, and this has become a hot topic on social media just in the last month. And so I think it's an important time for us to have these discussions from an evidence-based standpoint. And so what I've been tasked with is to quickly go through velocity and weighted ball programs. And, and this is not going to be a thorough review of the literature. I'm going to try to hit in 10 minutes, just some high points, just to kind of get the ball rolling for the discussion that we'll have a bit later on. So I have no disclosures for this. Some of the slides, um, Dr. Shumsky and Dr. Chris and myself have kind of shared together. So we'll start with velocity. You see a picture of Johan Duran. If anyone's familiar with the Twins or Major League Baseball, this guy pumps 103, 104 pretty consistently. So this is um, here. This is a lay article that Tom Berducci wrote back in Sports Illustrated in May of last year, just highlighting the rapid increase in velocity that we've seen in Major League Baseball, at least. And we'll touch on, on some of the younger kids as well. And so we just see some of the high points that he touched on here, as well as the graphs that we see below. And and, you know, 27 pitchers hit 100 miles per hour in April 2023, and that was the same in the entire 2013 season, just 10 years before. The number of 100 mile per hour pitches tripled over three years, if you compare 2019 to 2022. The number of pitchers who can throw 100 miles an hour plus have doubled since 2019 and tripled since 2018. And pitchers that can hit 102 miles an hour that happened more times in April of 2023 than all of 2021. So with these, we see that there has been a rapid increase just over the last several years in, in players that can throw over 100 miles an hour. So if we go down to the, the lower levels and the younger kids, Dr. Chris's paper from September of 2022 in AJSM, they looked at pitchers drafted in the top five rounds of the 2020 draft, and they found – that these pitchers reached 90 miles per hour at an average of 16.7 years. And this was the youngest age when looking at high school showcase data from 2011 through 2020. And, and so by 2020, they were reaching 90 miles per hour at a younger age. They also found that peak fastball velocity was the strongest predictor for UCL reconstruction. And, and so that, that is a theme that we'll talk about where we find peak fastball velocity being a strong independent risk factor for, for injury. So if we go down even lower and even younger kids, this is a study in AJSM in 2020 out of Japan. 
where they looked at 256 elementary school players, mean age of 11.6 years, and found that pitch velocity was significantly associated with past and present elbow pain. If you look at the bottom, we see an increase in pitch velocity is, is associated with an increased risk of medial epicondyle abnormality and medial elbow pain by a factor of three times. Increase, if we look across the literature, increased velocity does certainly seem to be and uh, lead to increased ulnar collateral ligament injury risk. These are just a few of the papers that are in the literature that highlight this. We'll talk briefly about the Chalmers paper and the Manzi uh, systematic review that we see just below that. So from the Chalmers paper, we see that they looked at MLB pitchers from 2007 to 2015. Take, granted, this is a 2016 paper in AJSM. They looked at over 1,300 pitchers. 309 of these underwent UCLR, and they found that peak pitch velocity was the primary independent predictor of whether a pitcher underwent UCLR. And interestingly, they found that pitch counts were not significant predictor of UCLR. So then if we go to the systematic review from Manzi and, and Dines just published in arthroscopy last year, we see a number of different things across a number of of age levels. And so pitch velocity, if they look across the entire, all of the literature that we have that's out there, the systematic review, pitch velocity was significantly correlated with elbow varus torque, which is essentially stress along the medial elbow. We see that again below with pitch velocity being associated with medial elbow distraction forces. Faster throwing velocity was positively associated with history of throwing arm injury in adolescents and high school players. And pitchers that throw faster prior to injury or they found that pitchers that had injury threw faster prior than uh, as compared to uninjured controls. Now it's at the professional level. And also at the professional level, we see UCLR being positively correlated with throwing velocity. So the question is, why has velocity increased? And so in that Tom Verducci article from May of last year, Dr. Fleissig is, is interviewed for, for that article. And he notes that just over the years, we have improved mechanics and an improved me understanding of biomechanics that we can, um, you know, impart along these improved mechanics to increase velocity. This follows with better strength and conditioning. As kids are getting older, as they get into the college levels and into the pro levels, we have better strength and conditioning with where they have a stronger kinetic chain and the ability to transmit force through a stronger kinetic chain, as well as improved mechanics to impart velocity. And then lastly, we have the weighted ball velocity training programs that we can look to as far as why are we seeing these increases in velocity. So with weighted ball training programs, you know, the purpose of them is to train throwing balls heavier than the standard five ounce baseball in order to increase throwing velocity. And so our questions are, do these programs increase velocity? And do they lead to increased injury risk? And we'll talk about that briefly here. So there have been a couple of good reviews just in the last five years uh, that have been done on this topic. And you see those here. If we take one of the tables from the Caldwell paper, paper, if we look across the literature, we certainly see from this table that it seems as if these weighted ball throwing programs do indeed increase throwing velocity. So in my opinion, this is probably the best weighted ball study that is out there. And so it's from Mike Reinhold and, and his group back in 2018. They looked at 38 healthy baseball pitchers, an average age of 15 years old with a range of 13 to 18. We had a weighted ball group where they did a three-week weighted ball training program three times a week using balls ranging from as light as two ounces to as heavy as 32 ounces. They also had a control group that trained just using a five ounce regulation baseball and both groups performed a strength training program. And so this is what they found. So in just six weeks, they found a 2.2 mile per hour increase in velocity in the weighted ball group. They also saw a 4.3 degree increase in shoulder external rotation weight range of motion in the weighted ball group. So keep that in mind. We'll go back to that in talking about the increase in, in shoulder external rotation range of motion. And interestingly, we saw no strength change in the weighted ball group and no change in arm speed in the weighted ball group. However, what we also saw was an increased injury rate in the weighted ball group compared to no injuries in the control group. So increased injuries, increased velocity, increased shoulder external rotation range of motion without any changes in strength of the arm or speed of the arm. So the question is, if there's no change in strength of the arm or no change in speed of the arm, what is causing the increased velocity from weighted ball training? 
So Reinhold and his group took it a step further and they went back to look at these changes in external rotation range of motion. So here we have 16 male high school baseball players. They trained with underload, overload, and extreme overload balls. And you see the, the weights there. Passive um, external and internal rotation range of motion was measured before and after each training session where they had 27 throws per session. We see in the underload balls, no difference in external rotation range of motion. In the overload balls, 3.3 degrees increase. And in the extreme overload balls, 8.4 degrees increase. So the thought is that these increases in shoulder external rotation range of motion may be the primary way by which we explain the increased velocity and the increased injury rates from throwing with weighted balls. So in putting all this together, so again, how is pitch velocity increased with weighted ball training programs? And again, not a change in arm strength or arm speed. It's this rapid increase in shoulder external rotation range of motion that happens acutely. And then as you continue to train with weighted balls, you get the more chronic changes of shoulder external rotation range of motion increases. This leads to increased pitch velocity. However, it also leads to increased shoulder and elbow forces. And there are a number of papers in the literature I just highlighted a few of them here that touch on this that show that that increased shoulder external rotation range of motion leads to increased shoulder and elbow forces as well as increased pitch velocity. So interestingly, I'm just throwing this in here, is this interesting paper from Brandon Erickson and his group on training with lighter baseballs. And what we found here is they did a 15 week program where they trained with lighter baseballs, three and four ounces, as well as the standard five ounce baseball were utilized as part of this training program. They did not use weighted balls or heavier balls. What they found were no injuries. However, they also saw fastball velocity to increase by a mean of 4.8 miles per hour. So this is a study that I will point families to, to say, you know, maybe we do have other means by which to train with different weighted balls to increase throwing velocity that doesn't impart the injury risk that the heavier balls possibly do. So I'm putting all of this together. We start with the use of overweighted balls. This leads to an increased shoulder external rotation range of motion. And Dr. Zaremski put this together. I'm not that smart with PowerPoint to make cool shapes like this. Um, this increased shoulder external rotation range of motion leads to increased pitch velocity. However, this also leads to increased shoulder and elbow forces. And both of these together, unfortunately, lead to increased injury risk. And so that's probably the simplest way to break it down from a velocity and weighted ball standpoint. So I'll use this to transition and, and I'll be done here in one minute. Um, we'll use this to transition to our editorial that, that Dr. Zrimsky, Dr. Chris, and myself put out um, in CJSM just last year. And just touching on the fact that maybe there needs to be a change in the way we're thinking about um, high school and adolescent pitchers and throwing athletes and how we're training them and, and how can we go about uh injury prevention and decreasing injury risk. And, and these are some of our recommendations that are in the paper. And we see here at the bottom with the weighted ball velocity programs, we make some comments on that as well. And so to touch on that, in our editorial, we touch on velocity and weighted ball programs. Really we say it's a risk versus reward discussion that's warranted with these players and their parents. And especially when this comes to skeletally immature athletes. I mean, certainly, Velocity is here to stay. Velocity works. Velocity gets kids onto teams and gets them scholarships and gets them pulled up through through ranks in the pro level. So velocity is here to stay, but we do have to have these discussions, especially with the younger kids about the risk versus reward of velocity in and of itself, as well as some of the training regimens to increase that velocity. So we mentioned is the epiphyses are two to five uh, times weaker than the surrounding osseous tissue. And this medial epicondyle epiphysis doesn't fuse until about 15 or 16 uh, years of age. So the medial elbow in adolescents are at significant risk of injury, given the increased medial elbow forces with increased velo and weight of all training programs. And our updated pitching restriction policies in the future need to consider this increased velocity and weighted ball programs as we're putting together these policies. So with that said, I will wrap up my part. Just wanted to touch on velocity and weighted balls just as a table setter for the discussion that we'll have uh, soon. And uh, I'll hand it over to Dr. Kita. So I'll start my slide. Hello, um, I'm from 
Japan, Kyoto, and thank you for your opportunity to talk and share Japanese perspective about baseball injury. So I, I'm an orthopedic surgeon in Japan, specialized in um, shoulder and elbow. And I met Jason in Florida, 2022 in WBSC under 18 Baseball World Cup. And I was team physician of Japan team. And I myself have played baseball from age of seven. And this is when I was 11 years old playing in Princeton, New, New Jersey, where I lived for two years. And so I'm happy to talk about baseball cultural differences in Japan and USA. And this baseball was introduced in Japan in 1872 by English teacher, Mr. Wilson from USA. And today there are 180,000 boys and girls playing playing baseball in Japan. So it's big um, sports for adolescent. And in 2015, the prevalence of pain among youth baseball players was investigated by uh, Japanese Federation and more than 35 players were aware of elbow pain and more than 20% have that sh shoulder pain. This is a present situation in Japan. And I don't, I don't know if you know about Koshien tournament. This is a prestigious event that has showcased the best Japanese high school players since uh, more than 100 years ago. And this national tournament, uh, 4,000 high school team all over the all over Japan. And it's nearly like um, showcase game plus uh, travel game. So uh, professional team scouts are watching. And if they are good in this tournament, they can be the professional baseball player. And the games are Qualifying round is four to eight games in each um, area of Japan. And final tournament, they gather to Koshien and five to six games to win the championship. And this occurs in very hot summer period and only in six weeks. So maximum pitch will be like 500 pitches per week. And and due to the tradition, it is not easy to change the system. It's not easy to change the rules, such as limiting the pitch count. So there is a lot of hurdles to overcome. And OCD is a, of capitalism is big issue in Japan, maybe more than in the United States. There, this is a survey of Little League in Texas and Oregon. It was about 0 to 4.8%. And by using ultrasound, several screening studies have shown the prevalence in Japan is two to 3% in Japan. This is the survey from Taiwan where baseball is very popular. The prevalence was 5.7%, that was high. On the other hand, study in Dominican Republic showed lower rate of OCD. They said they don't let kids throw a lot don't practice long time, but there are many major league players from this country. So too much practice for young kids may not be important for to raise good players. And indication of non-operative treatment is early stage for OCD and basically non-operative treatment to restrict using the elbow during sports activity. But Compliance in this age group is not always good because pain will go, will go away after a few weeks of rest. We also approach to scapulothoracic function and hip joint function to improve kinetic chain and to improve throwing mechanics. This is 11 years old, 11 year old boy, OCD stage one, and he was advised to stop throwing and completely healed, but it took a um, long time, nearly one year. The key for successful non-operative treatment is to start treatment in early stage, but how, 
the symptoms of OCD are less in early stage. So it is difficult to detect early stage OCD before the symptoms become worse and finally visit hospital. So we established the OCD ultrasound screening system, detecting OCD by ultrasound and treat them conservatively in early stage. Uh, by collaborating with baseball federations, we have started annual OCD screening in Kyoto Prefecture since 2008, and we have checked over 30,000 30, adolescent baseball players in total so far. We compared the results of conservative treatment of OCD detected by ultrasound screening with those of OCD diagnosed only after direct visit to hospital, and the result is the ultrasound screening group stage one was more like 60%, while in the hospital group stage three with free bodies were 35%. And there were more early stage OCD in the ultrasound screening group. So the result of the conservative treatment is better in the ultrasound screening group and hospital group over 70% un underwent surgery. So the ultrasound screening of OCD enabled medical intervention for early stage OCD and improved the result of the conserv conservative treatment. And this is uh, this system is uh, spreading throughout Japan now. And Little League elbow, the medial side injury is also an important issue for young baseball players. And this is a uh, overuse injury and the progression of medial epicondyle humerus is like this slide and apophysial stage around 10 years old is the most high risk group for the, this injury and and the most of them the risk factors are excessive pitching and fatigue and improper mechanics. And this cannot be solved by only medical staff like us. The co cooperation with collaborating with baseball team coaches and federation is uh, necessary, I think. And I want to show you the this uh, pr uh, preventive study reported by Dr. Sakata. He is his original series of exercise is called Yokohama Baseball 9 exercise. And this uh, functional exercise significantly reduced the medial elbow pain of little leaguers. And of course, the pitch count is important. This is Dr. Matsura's study, the effect of pitch limits reported. And 70 pitches per game or fewer in elementary school games um, made less elbow pain than the team which uh, team which did not limit the number of pitches. And after this study, so it's after this study, pitch count rules were revised in Japan. So it's only few years that pitch count started. The recommendation was um, there was similar in Japan. It was since 1995. It was not recent, but the Federation did not make this as a rule. And this is a study that this recommendation was really not known by all coaches and compliance rate was very low in Japan. So the more lectures like this for um, coaches and parents are, I think it, it's important. Okay, this is the Japanese perspective. Thank you. That that was awesome. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bowers and Dr. Akita. Um, so are you the one that showed Otani how to hit all those home runs? Yeah, I'm happy right. that he's good, doing good. He's doing pretty well, yeah. All right, so what I'm going to do is... I have a whole bunch of questions here um, and we're going to try to go through them. And what we'd like is uh, for our panelists, um, if you could be on camera, 
for the audience, you are more than welcome to write in questions to the chat. Um, they are, it is an open chat. Um, and we're going to try to hit some of the big questions. And if there's, you're writing questions in that I don't see that maybe is becoming a hot topic before I do that, we're going to limit it to about 45 minutes, just respectful of folks' time, particularly on the East Coast. So we're going to start with Dr. Chris. You're first up. So as the pediatrician on the panel, what do you tell parents and the athletes of a pre-high school baseball or softball player the best way to minimize injury as a pitcher or catcher? Is it mechanics? Is it off-speed pitches? Uh, which is a loaded question, I know. Is it different training techniques? How how do you approach this when you're in, when you're in your clinical exam room? Thanks, Jason. Thanks again for having me be part of this uh, esteemed panel. This is really fantastic. So I assume my practice is is pretty similar to everyone that's on this panel and probably a lot of the audience. Where most of the middle school throwing athletes I'm having this conversation are in my office as the result of a throwing injury. Uh, they've sustained. Most commonly, it's going to be little league elbow, medial epicondyl, um, avulsion fractures, little league shoulder, certainly OCD, both radio capitellar. I had a trochlear today, which is rare, but we see them. Um, and occasionally partial tear UCL injuries in that, that middle school population. So quite honestly, we spent a lot of time uh, discussing your model for injury causality slide in some aspects. You know, we talk about the factors that predispose them and made them susceptible. There are two extrinsic factors that I think in middle school baseball uh, require some discussion. Uh, there's that big jump in middle school uh, from the 46-60 field to the 60-90 field. And in my opinion, I don't think that gets enough discussion as an extrinsic risk factor, particularly for that 11, 12-year-old age player. Um, and then here, at least in the Northeast, I don't know about the rest of the country, but our middle school scholastic seasons and the travel seasons actually coincide for those sixth through eighth graders. So kids right through like 14U baseball. So uh, unlike 15U, which is freshman year, most travel organizations don't postpone the start of their season until after middle school season ends. So if you talk about those workloads, you know, I think that's a big um, factor in terms of those early season injuries we're seeing in middle schoolers particularly with these open growth plate injuries that we're talking about. Um, I do spend a lot of time still utilizing PitchSmart documents from MLB and PitchSmart website uh, for education. They're age specific. And I think they can really reinforce uh, prevention strategies. You know, we talk about pitch counts, days of rest, but it's also um, appropriate ages for developing off-speed and breaking pitches are in there too. And so like we've talked about all this conjecture on social media recently, regarding the causes of throwing injury. I think it's really important for us as the medical community to endorse and support these guidelines like PitchSmart. I think many of us agree they need an update, but I still think uh, we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We'll talk about pitch uh, counts and pitch restriction policies, I'm sure tonight. Um, some of this is compliance, adherence, you know, adults actually um, <laughs> doing their role in protecting kids, you know, in tournaments and showcases and everything else. And I think I think there's still opportunity here. So um, sometimes I'll talk about, um, we've talked about some studies. Um, there's one that I like from Chris Ahmad's group. It was a survey study from OJSM in 2019, where they surveyed over 200 baseball pitchers, most of them were professional pitchers, and they asked them their opinions on the cause of uh, UCL injuries. And so uh, nearly a, a quarter of the 200 pitchers had undergone Tommy John surgery. And what the survey found was that over half of pitchers, so 55% uh, with a UCL injury, had a history of elbow injuries as a child or adolescent compared to 18% in the uninjured group. So we've talked a lot about this tonight, and you, you showed that on that slide initially. Where does this injury um, process begin? We certainly know it's as a child or adolescent. So I bring that up because I think oftentimes we're going to see these kids as repeat customers. You know, We're going to see them in high school with, with maybe more concerning injuries, surgical injuries. And then finally, I spent a lot of time emphasizing, if possible, beginning strength training in middle school. Um, not Olympic bar lifts, but kettlebell, dumbbell, med bell exercises, even sprinting, jumping, you know, explosive uh, athletic maneuvers. I think sometimes it's hard to find instructors who are knowledgeable in that age group, um, but they do exist. Um, I think Dr. A.B. Fagenbaum, who's at the College of New Jersey, really has been the bellwether for us in pediatric sports medicine. He showed us the kids today as a whole are generationally weaker and slower when we compare them to 
20 to 40 years ago. And I don't think the COVID pandemic has helped, if anything, that's compounded that decline. And I think if we're expecting kids and their parents and coaches and we're expecting them all to reach these velocities of 90 plus in high school, you really can't do that without establishing a foundation of strength and muscular fitness. So I think while fatigue has received a lot of attention as a risk factor of throwing injuries, uh, suboptimal muscular fitness that we're seeing is also a risk factor and probably deserves further investigation. So I'm a big proponent of, I think as a baseball community, we should be establishing a standardized mobility and strength screen for adolescent baseball and softball players to determine the readiness to initiate these loads, these velocity programs. And I think that's gotta be a prior priority if we're gonna really uh, hope to alter that current trajectory of elbow surgery in youth and high school pitchers. So, I mean, that's awesome. I wanna bring in uh, Dr. Zoliver and Dr. Holtz, um, you know, really as our softball experts and particularly with the windmill pitch. So. Uh, I want your opinions, you know, uh, you know, with the windmill pitch, obviously from a mechanical standpoint is opposite of the baseball pitch. Um, but really, and this is the, with Dr. Oliver's research, the importance of the connect chain and full body strengthening and pain associated with injuries. Do you probably be providing guidance that maybe you recommend some things a little bit differently in your adolescent kind of pre-high school age group as opposed to maybe your older high schoolers or your collegiate athletes, Dr. Oliver, Dr. Holtz, how would, how would you approach that? Uh, it's just to reiterate what Dr. Chris just said, uh, the fact of the lack of mobility or strength. And when he said like a uh, kettlebell exercises, just some basic movement exercise, I, I know a lack of postural awareness. There's a lot there that can be done. And yes, as we're on a softball advisory pitching committee, it's totally different. But at the end of the day, and uh, y'all all know I've said that throwing is throwing is throwing. It's a different arm slot. So um, no matter what the arm slot is for any throwing movement, all throwing movement should be a total body movement. Hands, period. So if the total body is not conditioned as at the young age, and that's where all the evidence goes for the injury, then whatever the movement is, they're going to end up only using their upper extremity, their arm for that movement. And I'll let Dr. Holtz continue on with that. Yeah, so, you know, I come from, like many of you, the clinical realm, kind of wearing my hat now. Um, I've also been a, a coach at the collegiate level, coached youth kit, youth sports um, at various competitive levels, and then obviously been a player myself. I think um, what I'm seeing now it, it, that is that seems to be helpful is this you know focus on the kinetic chain um from a coaching uh research medical community but every time a kid comes into my office and I say stand on one leg and they can't I'm like that's why you're hurt that's why you're hurt right and so and usually it's the back leg you know the the leg that's pushing away from the mound so when I'm looking from a medical lens or a coaching lens, um, I'm always looking at that back leg and the, the, the athlete's ability to balance on it as an indicator of whether or not they're gonna get hurt. Um, I did a very small project as a fellow here at the University of British Columbia with our baseball and softball throwers to develop a, an injury screening tool that was actually quite comprehensive. And we did find um, that something like the Y balance test um, we didn't have the power to say predicted injury, but certainly kids that were saying that they had a sore arm were less able to, you know, push the little knob thing uh, farther away from them standing on one leg. So for me, that regardless of whether they're a teenager or a collegiate athlete, that's the first thing I ask them to do. So to basically to summarize, you know, what, what you and Dr. Oliver and Dr. Chris said, I mean, it, you know, when you go back to a particular at the younger age groups, it really goes back to the basics, learn how to throw correctly, learn how to train correctly. If you're going to commit to playing baseball and or softball, particularly as you start to work your way up, 
you have to prepare for what you're going to do, prepare for to prepare, so to speak. Um, you know, I want to bring in Dr. Griffith and Dr. Bowman, um, because there's been, you know, a bunch of different questions on the chat that Dr. Bowers is going to get into, but, you know, there's been this change of, you know, as I mentioned with some of the data that's been put out publicly, that it used to be, you hear about Tommy John injuries and UCL reconstruction and now repairs, and now even a hybrid with, with one or two surgeons, um, for, you know, you're 25, you're 30, trying to finish your career off. And now it's, it's just commonplace. So I, I was curious, Dr. Griffith um, and Dr. Bowman in, in the Atlanta metro area or the Nashville metro area, what population do you see most in your clinic for you know some form of surgical intervention? And how's that even changed just from five or 10 years ago? Yeah, I can start first if you like, Jason. And thanks again for inviting me. Um, I would say 50% of my surgical population is high school. The other 50% is probably 30% collegiate, 20% professional. Um, the biggest and kind of most depressing change I've seen is the ages of the patients. I actually saw my first 14-year-old that needed uh, UCL surgery a few weeks ago. So, I mean, I, it was rare to see somebody 15. You know, we would start 16 or 17, but those numbers have creeped lower and lower and lower over time. So that's really kind of evolved. I mean, fortunately, we do have the repair procedures and option. I think that's uh, potentially made things easier or given us a, a faster option to get back. Um, but yeah, the, the, the decrease in age has become a, a really, really prevalent change. Dr. Bowman, what about yourself? Yeah, thanks again for having me on here. And uh, and I think this is great that we're putting this on, that you guys have done this, that uh, this is how we're going to solve this problem is bringing people together from uh, even different disciplines to to really sit down and think about what's going on, and, and uh, we have to be advocates for our for our athletes at the end of the day. And so I think it's it's great that you're doing this, and uh, thanks for allowing me to be involved. Um, so I've been in practice for six years. Just some background: and I trained at Curl and Joe, a lot of UCL reconstructions, but in 2019 is really kind of when you know when uh, Dugas's paper came out with UCL repair and some of his data. So in that kind of late, uh, well, you know, within the last, right, five to 10 years is when the repair has really become a viable option uh, and and been backed up by the data and the biomechanics. And so uh, I think that has uh, revolutionized some of the surgery that we do. I would say most of what I'm doing is repairs. Most of it is in high school and collegiate uh, athletes. Uh, and uh, to have that, you have to have good tissue to do a repair for one, and it has to be uh, certain types of tears. So for instance, mid-substance tears, or if there's significant degeneration of the tissue, those aren't going to be repairable. Those are going to be reconstructions. Uh, but younger younger athletes now are, are needing these and uh, wanting to continue to play. And so uh, it is a it is a nice option. Usually we, you know, I think I saw a question about an internal brace, but basically what that is, is it's a, it's a seat belt for the UCL as you are uh, repairing UCL, putting that in to help uh, uh, decrease some of the stress. Um, I would say uh, over time, what I would expect to see is probably even more of what we would consider a hybrid type procedure, uh, which is uh, where you have um, a reconstruction or, or a graft rather, uh, in addition to repair. So I don't know if Tim has any experience with those. I haven't done any of those yet, but I think as you start to see uh, these these um, repairs and revision uh, move on towards higher level athletes, you're going to see sort of a repair construct with a graft and and a, an internal brace type construct. I would say those are some of the changes that have this, this is kind of a rapidly developing area over the past few years. Gotcha. So you know, um, this is one that's been brought up a lot, and I fully recognize that there is not really any official public data out there. Well, what's your opinion? And have you seen data that indicates the pitch clock at the professional levels, whether it be major or minor, or even high level D1 collegiate, although that's gonna be a little different with the pitch clock, um, is a factor for throwing related injuries. Um, th there are some other professionals that think fatigue in the older pitchers may affect them more. This is obviously be at the professional levels. But what do you, what do you what do you two think? And anyone else can chime in. But you know, particularly since you're taking care of Vandy, AAA, Dr. Griffith for the Braves, uh, as well as Dr. Bowers, what are your thoughts on the the whole pitch clock conundrum that's gone nuts on uh, on Twitter or X? 
Yeah, I mean, my, my thoughts personally are that, you know, I just don't see any evidence that it's really relevant yet. Um, the MLB claims they have data out of Johns Hopkins that shows that there's no increase in injuries, but it's really hard to isolate that as a data point. Um, but uh, yeah, I, there's too many other factors at play for us to really isolate and say that this is an issue and that the pitchers have other motivations at play by, by complaining about this. So we have to keep that in mind. Yeah, Dr. same here. We, we've been using yeah, sorry, it. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, we've been using it in AAA for a couple of years now. And most of the pitchers, and I think you're seeing, you'll see a division between the younger pitchers and the older pitchers. I think the younger pitchers, they've kind of grown up, or at least they've had that that mindset, whereas the the older pitchers uh, aren't, uh, they haven't, that's not how they trained and, and, and developed over the years. So you will see a divide, I think. You know, you talk to any pitcher, I mean, pitching is basically like hit training. You know, you go out and you're, your your heart rate is peaking in the upper hundreds and then you go and you sit down for a while and we don't we don't really train our pitchers even uh and on, on a daily basis to to take those kind of loads uh so then you put a pitch clock and yeah they're gonna start to fatigue a little bit quicker and get later in the count etc so um I, I, you're right there's no data yet but uh i think it's overall it seems it's helped with game speed and things like that so i'm not sure that it's going to go away i think it's it's just one 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 more component of sort of the workload uh, equation that will will eventually maybe come up with that, um, you know, the, some of the technology is even there looking at uh, biomechanics and Major League Baseball doesn't let us use in-game uh, biomechanical data, but you can biomechanically sort of see uh, how a pitcher starts to fatigue and the stress that they put on their uh, on their arms. I don't know if any of the uh, biomechanical people can can comment, but, um, you know, maybe at some point that'll be be relevant to in-game decisions. So let's move on to something that I think is, you know, has been pretty much in, in the news. It's, you know, folks are aware of this, been aware of it, you know, particularly, you know, and to give a lot of respect to Major League Baseball, Little League Baseball and, T and USA Baseball, really kind of brought this more to the forefront of the United States since 2014 with MLB Pitch Smart. Uh, Japan added in some pitch count guidelines uh, in their country. I believe it was 20, 20, either 2016 or 2019. Um, and, and Dr. Kazu presented on some of it. But, you know, for the panel, and anyone can jump in, do pitch count restrictions actually work for injury prevention? And if so, at, at what levels? I mean, it's a little bit of a loaded question because I know the answer. But um, I do think they're they work differently for different age groups. And I would be curious what, what folks think, Dr. Bowers, you know, if you want to jump in since uh, you haven't got a chance to talk in a little while, what are, what are your thoughts on pitch count restrictions? Yeah. So I think that, and we've kind of gone through this on, on Twitter recently. I, I think that pitch count restrictions are low hanging fruit as far as what, what can we do to change as far as implementation goes um, what can we identify and implement and enforce? I think across, if we're talking about at the high school level with Perfect Game and, and some of these other organizations that is low-hanging fruit as far as what can we go after that we can track and we can enforce. And so I think that is the relevance of, of pitch counts. But I think just as as you had had mentioned, you you know the answer of of do they actually work for injury prevention and in in-game pitch counts certainly are not a true indicator of workload and, and number of pitches when you talk about pregame and bullpens and, and those sorts of things. But I do think there is utility there as far as one of the easier things we can try to control and enforce, although we're doing a bad job of it now and non-compliance with pitch smart we know is is very high up to 90 percent in some of these tournaments and and so i think we have to do a better job of of enforcing these pitch counts and i've got some some questions in the chat we'll go through as well so if y'all are putting questions in the chat I'm, we're not ignoring them so we'll ask those a bit later so i wanted to bring back uh doctors oliver and holtz you know on you know there, there's obviously a ton of stuff on pitch counts out there but quite honestly except for one or two kind of expert opinion uh papers there is nothing uh for softball uh, you know we have it from high school in the united states at every state plus the district of columbia we have suggestions at higher levels uh, and obviously players at the collegiate level and above uh, professionally are, are taken very well, um, taken care of. 
But, you know, how do we apply pitch counts maybe to relievers as opposed to starters? And then here's kind of the question from the softball perspective. What are your thoughts on pitch counts for softball pitchers as opposed to baseball pitchers? Uh, the overall, it goes to the misnomer, right? That the softball pitch is an easier pitch on the body. So then it's like, okay, you don't need those pitch counts. But at the end of the day, uh, like Dr. Holtz and I have been saying, it's reiterated that uh, it's a throwing motion, a total body motion. If you're throwing at a, uh, as your velocity increases, the forces about your uh, shoulder and elbow are going to increase hands down. So you have to look at mechanics. But um, my point is that, yes, as the panel has said, pitch counts are something that we can monitor how, as we've done in baseball. However, the monitoring is lacking. Thus, as we are looking to move forward with softball and getting some restrictions, we're looking at, it's more than just pitch count. There, There's other things that go into it. Um, and again, it's, uh, it's the mechanics. And I know we have a lot of people on this uh, that are viewing this that could be parents. And hands down, baseball or softball, if you didn't know your pitch count, if you were to take a photo of your son or daughter in the first inning when they stood on the mound, you take a photo of them in the second inning, third inning, keep taking a photo. And when you see their posture slump, it doesn't matter how many they thrown that if they are lacking in their posture, then that's going to influence the mechanics. So no, I did not answer the question on pitch counts. <laughs> We're still looking to develop because that's a, a way loaded question that we have to figure out. And yes, it is individualized, but we do have to have some type of restrictions to reel in the extremes. But at the end of the day, if you don't know anything, take a still pic of your kid. And I guarantee you, as you see, you could probably, and um, that is the one study we haven't done, but you could almost correlate the number of pitches with their standing posture. So what you're saying, and this is, a, you and I have spoken about this, is pitch counts do not equal workload or your load. Pitch counts are part of workload which I think has been a big Correct. misnomer on social media and other places in the media. So I appreciate you addressing this. Um, because uh, I would have a yeah. pitcher that could throw 70 prior to the game and one that could throw three. It's all about, the, there's a lot more to it. Pitch counts are, yes, our easiest way to regulate. However, uh, my point, and as uh, those of you who are on the softball pitching advisory committee, why recreate what we don't really know in baseball? Let's go one step forward. Baseball, they're not following the pitch counts. So we know that we could have pitch counts, but we need a little more. And it's a little more than pitch counts. But yes, pitch counts can work. However, they are not the sole thing that is going to prevent injury prevention. You, uh, I said it, just looking at pinch, <laughs> pitch count, I do not think it's going to prevent injury. I, I was ready to pick you up, Gretchen. Uh, it's funny. <laughs> and, and Dr. Holtz will pick me yeah. up on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm okay going out and saying softball doesn't need pitch counts. Uh, I think maybe two years ago, I was on the other side of the fence. Um, I loved your paper, yours, and um, well, all three of you guys are on the on the panel. So Robbie and Jason, your paper uh, that I had the pleasure of reviewing, um, I think really outlines beautifully the argument against pitch counts and that perhaps, you know, simplifying it does it a disservice. So trying to get everyone to comply with the pitch smart regulations is perhaps a waste of time. Um, that being said, I think they're a really great opportunity to open the discussion around how to treat athletes 
you know, what are some, some constraints that we can create for, for youth athletes that help promote, you know, sport as a, a tool for, for health. Um, I'll just say for those of you that might not be aware that unlike baseball where elbow injuries are the big issue in softball, um, the shoulder is the big issue and um, three quarters of softball pitchers in high school and at the collegiate level report shoulder pain and whether or not that shoulder pain affects their performance and their ability to, to play, you know, into their twenties um, at the Olympic level is something that's still, you know, under investigation. And there is, uh, it looks like there's the beginnings of a relationship between individuals who pitch more than 85 pitches during a game, having an increased risk of injury. So there is something there when it comes to workload and injury risk in softball. But I would suggest that, you know, perhaps we need to look at preseason throwing volume because that's where injuries occur the, the highest in both softball and baseball. So maybe we should, you know, educate coaches about restricting and certainly in softball pitching full games early in the season. I always like to educate coaches about, you know, pitchers don't need to be throwing full games in March, especially in Vancouver, Canada, when it's freezing. And then I wonder also about maybe focusing more on additional rest days. You know, I think that's something that we probably could steal from baseball, this focus on rest days in between starts. In my view, there's no reason why um, a high school or even collegiate pitcher needs to throw Saturday, Sunday, and then throw again midweek for a game on Wednesday. Like, why are we doing that? Well, I know we're doing it in, at the college level because we need that win on Wednesday. If we were to drop a, a loss to a, you know, a local team on a Wednesday, then our national ranking goes down the tubes, but you know, really in a perfect world, do we really need that our, our starter to start on a Wednesday after throwing all weekend? So I think there are some other factors that we could look at um, and not get distracted by pitch counts as Dr. Oliver suggests. Yeah. And Kaya, I think you brought up a great point as well in that one, uh, if you look at, you know, some of the data that is out there, it's not an individual one day or one week. It's, you know, the doctor, Dr. Meta's paper on looking at things for three years with Brittany Dowling or Dr. Dowling as well is it's a chronic workload. It's an accumulation, accumulation, but I love the fact that you brought up the early season injuries. Well, where did we see a lot of uh, uh, high profile injuries in, in major league baseball? It was in April. And if you look at the data for 20, 30 years, it's always, you know, for, for the most part, April and May, um, unless you're down for California, maybe it's February. But I mean, it's basically once you get into the season, the injury rate goes down. And that has been consistent for for as long as probably since Dr. Fleisig started collecting data on this stuff. So I think that's fantastic that you brought that up. And trying to develop some ideas about how do we ramp up pitchers a little bit better, whether you're in a cold weather climate or a warm weather climate or somewhere in between. Um, this kind of brings us back into, you know, I'll, I'll defer to Dr. Bowers a little bit since he presented on this, but I, I wanted to take the velocity discussion kind of one step further. Um, you know, I grew up in Chicago. I remember watching Greg Maddox and, you know, Maddox was the best when he threw 92, 93. Now Max is one of the best pitcher of all time. So it's, he's like, you know, it's like talking about Jordan or LeBron for basketball, so it's not really fair. But, you know, I played collegiate baseball. A lot of us on this panel played high-level sport. And then Dr. Holtz obviously played very high-level sport. You know, I don't remember ever being taught or our pitchers being told, you have to throw 110% every single time you throw a ball. It was kind of that 90 to 95% mentality. So you had a left in the tank for the last inning or if you needed to get an out or something. So this concept of max effort pitching all the time in conjunction with velocity, uh, you know, Dr. Bowers and then anyone else who wants to jump in, um, what are your thoughts on this? You know, I mean, because this is some, this is a newer principle on top of the velocity programs. Yeah. So I, you know, I talked on, on velocity and, and I think, um, put my thoughts out there on that. And I think there's something certainly to the, to the max effort, uh, uh, theory that we have to pitch max, F F max effort all the time. So I'm going to actually turn this around on, uh, on Dr. Griffith and Dr. Bowman and, uh, and see what their thoughts are on velocity and, and the, the max effort issue. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. Um, I mean, I, I think it's pretty obvious that velocity is an issue here. 
Um, with the max effort, I think my biggest concern is just like kind of Jason was highlighting, I mean, it's fatigue. So, I mean, if we have people going at max effort with fatigue and then many of the other factors we've discussed, you're going to have problems. So, again, I think these are all difficult um, topics to kind of isolate when it comes to research studies and really kind of trying to get some good uh, objective data. But at the same time, I think we all know that the factors that are most common here and have been published on over and over and over again. Yeah, I'd agree. The uh, velocity, as you've seen each year that as it goes up, um, that is, that's putting more stress on the ligament, right? The ligament can only take so much stress. And then you start adding in things with, with the grips and putting hor motion, horizontal motion on the ball. Then what you're doing is you're fatiguing, you're, you're wearing out the pronator. You, so you're putting, you're pronating or supinating your pitches to get movement on it. You're, you're basically wearing out your, your backup stabilizers, right? So uh, it's a combination of velocity and then adding in motion. Uh, you're sort of fatiguing the system and then putting it at risk, um, you know, driving 100 miles down the freeway. Uh, and then, you know, you know, it's so easy to learn a new pitch now because you just get on TikTok or, or uh, Instagram and you can learn a new pitch and, and you go out and you try it and you're and you see kids, you know, trying to get movement on every single pitch, throwing it as hard as they can. I think that's to Jason's point that, uh, you know, kids don't just go out and, you know, have fun and throw anymore. That it's, it's a max effort every time. And, and, uh, at some point that system is going to fail. So, you know, this kind of goes back to something that I put up. Do we think, you know, based on the data, uh, and the evidence we have is, is it velocity? I mean, we know there's about 10 or 15 factors. I think we all agree on that. Um, it's not just pitch count. Is it velocity or is there something else? Is it the fact that, you know, we we are going to see the most highly visible, which are typically your MLB pitchers and occasionally, you know, this time of the year in May, June, your NCAA Division One softball pitchers and baseball pitchers because um, they're on TV all the time. Um, is it velocity or is there something else going on now, you know, with like spin rate or with the sweeper? Um, I, I'm open to anything and I, and I want to bring it back in uh, and Dr. Kazu also, because are you seeing this kind of growth in velocity for your high school pitchers in Japan? Um, I think, um, I think velocity is very important factor because other, other factors are uh, improving recent years, but UCL reconstruction is increasing. And I think the velocity and maximum effort pitching is doing very bad thing for UCL. Yeah, so, hey, I don't want to ask just uh, uh, Tim and Eric again, but in taking care of, of high-level throwers at the professional and collegiate levels, um, what are your thoughts? Certainly, you know, if you look in the in the media, you can see Dr. Meister's thoughts on on the newer pitches, such as hard changeups and sweepers, um, and also how spin rate comes into this. What are your thoughts on um, how spin rate and some of these newer kind of designer pitches and where we're learning how to shape pitches? Where does that come in as far as injury risk? Yeah, I mean, the way I look at it is I think velocity plus spin rate you know, equals injury. So, I mean, these players are all throwing harder pitches. Even our off-speed pitches are faster. So you're really, really pumping the velocity while trying to add spin. The sweeper is an interesting pitch and in that the amount of horizontal movement that it has. And Keith's whole point is that, um, you know, he essentially thinks that you can kind of figure out where a tear would occur based off the type of pitches that are thrown. And I, there's not a whole lot of data to suggest that other than his, you know, kind of level five experience. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think those two things add together. Um, all this, I think really starts at youth. So I think we have really have to start from the ground up on this problem. Um, start dealing with some of the little league issues and then the year round playing. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think it, I think it's a combination uh, of course, velocity is, is going to be, you know, emptying the gas tank, but then the way they're gripping, you know, that with, you know, sticky stuff, you know, all those conversations that have come up over the years, we've taken that away from pitchers. So now they have to grip it extra hard and that fatigues the the muscles uh, all the more. And then you're trying to get that motion. So yeah, you're just kind of ramping up the level of, of, uh, 
of effort with every single pitch. I think that's the problem. Yeah. Sweeper, I, I would say, you know, I've heard what, what Keith has said and, and it certainly makes sense to me. Um, I can't say that I, I have a whole lot of experience with, as far as volume of seeing those injuries um, from that specific pitch, but um, certainly makes sense what he's saying with, with, with uh, adding in that uh, extra horizontal motion, basically a sweeper is where you try to get even extra break on the ball by really, forcefully supinating or pronating and a lot of pitchers you know just like tim was saying you know it starts at the younger levels um you know you know pitchers used to take years to kind of develop a certain pitch and now they just jump in and start using it with without really their body or their you know they're adapting to it and so i think even at the higher levels what we're what we're doing is we're teaching to the test scouts are going out and looking at kids and they're looking for velocity they're looking for spin rate and so that's what we're teaching our kids and they're, we're just going to keep teaching to the test, which is going to keep putting them at risk. And then, uh, Dr. Holtz, you had your, uh, your hand up. What's up? Yeah. You know, I'm always good for a question. Uh, <laughs> wondering with all the focus on, on the, the kids and, um, collegiate athletes and professional athletes being injured, has anyone done a study? I'm looking at you guys. Has anyone done a study looking at protective factors? You know, if we look at all the guys throwing 100 miles an hour in Major League Baseball, half have had Tommy John surgery and the other half have not. Well, what is unique about the half that have not? Robbie, do you know the answer? You're smarter than I, I am. Don't know. Yeah, so I don't know <laughs> the answer to this question. I think it's interesting in this situation where mechanics and strength and some of those things come into play. I don't know the answer to that question. And, and I mean, Dr. Oliver may know the answer to that question a little bit better as far, as far as protective factors and all the work you've done, what are some of the protective factors? But I think it's where, you know, mechanics and strength certainly uh, comes into play. But, you know, beyond um, beyond workload and overuse, you know, these these kids, I mean, that's where we get to the point where we're at the major league level. We have great workload monitoring and lots of data that, that we can look at. But, you know, have they been set up for injury over the years, whereas kids, they're throwing harder and they're throwing more and they're specializing early. You know, if we don't combat this at the earlier ages, I'm not sure the, the pro level is where you're going to make the biggest change. It's the earlier ages uh, where we can combat some of this overuse and probably where it's a little bit more blatant at this point. Uh, to try to to limit injury risk as as these players get older and get to the point where, you know, they're getting to college and pros because when they when they get to college and pros and they've already had a UCL reconstruction, then I think that's where we're going to learn more is what is return to play rates and what do their careers look like after they've already had one and then the second time in their pro career they have a, a revision. But what is their career going to look like after that? And and I, I certainly think those are things that we'll learn as as time goes on. Yeah. And the one thing I wanted to mention before uh, I turn back over to Robbie is, you know, unfortunately, I think once someone has had an issue, whether it was surgical or not, you have a partial tear, you have a flexor forearm injury, and then you continue to develop velocity, the horse is out of the barn. I mean, that's why I think ultimately we as a community are going to make the, our biggest mark on kids before they get to the high school age group or before they start maturing physically in their sophomore, junior years of high school. Because if something occurs and they're a junior, senior in high school and they get better, or maybe Dr. Bowman, Dr. Brooke do surgery on them, they recover and they do their thing. Well, they already have multiple risk factors. And then you start eating to a high velo, high max effort pitcher. Um, those folks are, are ripe to unfortunately have a recurrent injury. And the data is very consistent across all levels uh, regarding that there's only about five minutes left so um, I took off the screen share and I was going to turn over to Dr. Bowers that he's been monitoring the the chat for anything we haven't addressed yet Robbie is there any you know a good question or two that maybe we can we can tackle yeah so there are a couple in the chat one thing before we get to the chat and there was you know some some people have touched on this you know I talked about weighted balls along with the velocity issue in my talk I'd like to get the thoughts on other individuals on the panel, your thoughts on weighted balls personally, both, both on, based on the data and personal experience. Dr. Chris is chomping at the bit and Dr. Anyone. I can just sense it. 
I, I can only give you anecdotally what our experience was here in the Northeast. I think when I'm not going to name a, a specific organization who now markets their weighted ball programs, but when these programs came out, you know, five, seven years ago, <clears throat> there were a handful of facilities in town uh, where you had pitching instructions, instructors who, who, who taught themselves a little bit more about weighted ball programs and were, were rolling these out. And unfortunately, they didn't have a lot of guidelines in terms of age groups or avoiding paper, perhaps using them in a skeletally immature kid. And we saw kids made gains. There's no question. You guys have shown all the systematic reviews. Uh, two to 11 miles per hour, right? So kids were making gains and all of a sudden these kids were packing these facilities, but then you saw this accumulation of injuries and and kind of high level, high prospect kids who then all of a sudden weren't pitching for their high school teams. And so um, I think, unfortunately, that first generation of kids was a little bit experimental. Now, I think, you know, we've learned a little bit more in terms of age groups to avoid and and maybe working more on developing external rotation strength with plyo drills and things like that versus maybe doing pull downs with heavier balls than a five ounce ball and things like that. But I'm sure these things still happen. I, I don't think there's great regulation. I think there's been a little bit more uh, of a science behind it and certain organizations nationally are are providing some guidelines with them. I, I still think, um, you know, and people will say, well, a five ounce ball is a weighted ball. So I think we have to remember that too. So it's not just the weighted ball, but the kids that are doing weighted ball programs tend to do all of these things, right? It's because more is better. And I think that's part of the issue and it's not just one factor. Dr. Oliver and then Dr. Keita. Oh. I totally agree. And um, one thing with the weighted ball is, are you monitoring those mechanics while they're doing that? Number one. Number two, we know that there's an increase in external rotation range of motion, right? Okay. But go back to the basics of the total body having to work together. So if we only get an increase of range of motion of one joint, then why are we not surprised that there's going to be an issue? Like if we're not doing anything to the rest of the body and we're only, and like what the evidence shows, it's like, okay, increase shoulder, external range of motion. So uh, then we had questions in the chat of, oh, well, is external rotation range of motion? Should we monitor that? No, but with some of the weighted ball stuff, we only focused on some upper extremity and we, it, it's not a holistic approach or what has previously been looked at. So uh, there can be pros and cons, but we have to have the total holistic approach. Why are we only looking at one thing with the weighted ball when we've already established that the throwing motion is a total body and then, but, oh, with a weighted ball, I get greater external rotation range of motion. We know that goes to velocity. So I don't, we don't have enough evidence and they need to be monitored throughout is uh, my philosophy. I totally agree with Dr. Chris, what he said, but that's, that's for us to step back and like, all we see is shoulder. Are we looking at the total body? Why aren't we doing other things other than just working on weighted ball at the shoulder for increasing shoulder range of motion? Which is a whole nother talk, Jason, that you can uh, develop. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I want to comment about um, light, light ball, the lighter ball, because in Japan, elementary school players use rubber and small and light ball, but they the injury is not so low. So I think it's too much to rely on light ball is um, danger. Just a comment, the one from Japan. So so you feel like as if there there is still the injury risk that comes with with lighter balls. Yes, um, right. because. Yeah, we use light bulbs under 12 years old, and there's still many injuries. So Got I want to be respectful of everyone's time. It's 10 o'clock exactly. I think we could probably talk for another couple hours, um, but we're, we're not going to do that, particularly for our East Coast folks. 
thank you all for logging on. We were up to over a hundred people. Um, and again, uh, I think we're up to 106 at one point. So, I mean, obviously it's very successful. I put a little message in the chat. Um, this will be placed on the AMSM uh, YouTube channel whenever Andy is able to get to it next day or two or so. You can pass on to whomever you'd like. We'd love to do more of these, you know, maybe, you know, a couple times a year or at least once or twice a year, and we could do specific topics. So if anyone has, you know, any thoughts, you know, as be, be kind if it's on social media, but if there's certain topics that y'all want to talk about, or, you know, Dr. Bowers and I are, are always helpful to, to kind of get the ball rolling as well. Our entire panel is very passionate about this. So with that, thank you all for attending. Thank you to our panel. Um, and thank you to Andy Meyer again and AMSM as well. And everyone uh, have a good night, or if you're in Japan, uh, have a good day at work. Bye. Thanks, everyone.